Okay, the last thing I want to cover for Bitcoin is if we go even one level above the user experience and think about a set of users or this sort of economy, I want to talk a little bit about um, how different financial issues work within Bitcoin uh, and answer questions like what, you know, what incentivize miners to participate in mining? How much is a Bitcoin worth? Uh, those, those types of issues. Okay. Um, so the first thing I'll note, uh, let's start with actually finance as opposed to economics. So Bitcoin uh, is meant to be its own currency. Uh, in other words, it's not a digital representation of Canadian dollars or US dollars or euros or anything like that. Okay, uh, It's not a digital representation of gold. Uh, some people tried to do that uh, in early days of, of eCash where they would take a bunch of gold and then they would issue kind of digital tokens that, that entitled you uh, to some amount of gold. Uh, this idea is actually being kind of reinvestigated uh, because Bitcoin's exchange rate is very volatile. Um, I'm going to pick up um, some of these issues later after we talk about Ethereum and we sort of set all the technical side, technical stuff aside, we're going to circle back to what are some applications of blockchain technology to finance. And there I'm going to give you a whole little mini lecture on, on finance and money and, and things like that. Um, so I, I'm not going to do a deep dive right now, but I, I just want to lay out a couple basic things that, that intersect with um, uh, the protocol itself. Okay, so Bitcoin's its own currency. Uh, we tend to refer to it as BTC. Uh, there was a movement to try and call it XBT instead, which is kind of a more standard format for currencies. Uh, it didn't really catch on. I, I say most people probably still use BTC. Um, the number of Bitcoins is capped. Uh, it will be 21 million. And uh, I say it will uh, in future ch in future tense because uh, we haven't reached there yet. So Bitcoin is still being minted, uh, and, and we talked about how some is released uh, with every single block, and every single block is is rate limited to once every ten minutes because of the proof of work and the consensus mechanisms. Um, so eventually we'll reach twenty one million, and I'll sh I'll show you sort of where we're at uh, in terms of that twenty one million. Um, but before I do, uh, twenty one million might not sound like a lot. Right, uh, you know, there's there's not even enough for one Bitcoin per person on on this planet, um, but I want you to remember that uh, Bitcoin is di is divisible. Okay, so there's 21 million Bitcoins, but the fact that it's a we talk about Bitcoins as opposed to fractions of Bitcoins is just convention, right? Uh, so the smallest transactional unit uh, in Bitcoin uh, has eight decimal places. Uh, and this is called a Satoshi after the person who invented Bitcoin, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Okay, so a Satoshi is the smallest uh, unit. Uh, it has eight decimal places. Now, because it's not divisible further, there's no way to, to transact this amount and still pay a fee, right? Because you can't, usually a fee is less than the amount that you're sending. And in this case, there's something less. Than this amount. So, um, and because miners really don't mine for free anymore, they demand fees. Uh, you know, the, the fees that they, they demand uh, means that there's a there's a bunch of really small amounts like this that that uh, you basically can't transact. Like you would pay more in fees than than you would to actually transact them themselves. We call this dust. Uh, Bitcoin dust because it's kind of like unrecoverable, but eventually depending on what happens to the exchange rate Maybe the, the, it will make economic sense to be able to transact these and pay a fee in other words Maybe the fees will will get smaller. Uh, so if, if point if one Satoshi is the fee then um, The amount the smallest amount you might send is, is maybe ten times a Satoshi or something like that um, So that still gives you about seven decimal places to work with where you can have a, a kind of 10% fee um, and you know that's that's pretty sensible. Um, so and, and we're not anywhere near like kind of uh, talking about uh, large uh, decimal places. There was a movement to start thinking about uh, one one hundredth of bitcoins, uh, and there was a, a movement to also start thinking about one one thousandth of a bitcoin. But 
right now, most people just still continue to think in terms of Bitcoin. Um, I'm really hesitant to put the exchange rate of Bitcoin into this lecture because it's going to time stamp it. <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll say that that as of today, when I record this, so it could be very, very different when when you watch this. But uh, Bitcoin's worth a couple thousand dollars. Um, so most things that you buy in Bitcoin uh, are going to be fractions of Bitcoins. It's, you're not going to spend an entire Bitcoin uh, buying something unless if it's sort of a, something that's that's more than a couple thousand dollars. Um, one one figure I'll put in that that's a little more um, a little more solid uh, is um, so with a big disclaimer uh, at time of recording. Um, what you can do is you can take all the Bitcoin that's ever been issued and you can multiply it by what one Bitcoin is worth and you get a number that's called the market capitalization of Bitcoin. And so right now that number is about a hundred billion dollars US. So there's about a hundred billion dollars of Bitcoin that have been issued. Um, so this is total Bitcoin. Okay, and depending, I mean, if you're in finance or economics, maybe you have a good sense of these terms, but uh, for a lot of people who are not, this just sounds like a big number. You know, how, how big is it exactly is, is hard to get a sense of. Um, so let me put this in context. So um, first off, I'll just note that we're in 2018 here. Um, okay, so so 100, and, 100 billion is, is about the total cost of Bitcoin. Um, if you want to talk about, say, US currency, um, it's around, I don't know the current number, but it's maybe five to $10 trillion. So it's kind of one decimal place over. Um, so, uh, sorry, this would be US dollars. And this is the US dollars in circulation. Uh, what, what's called M1 or, or the, the base money supply. Uh, so there's different ways of, of adding up the amount of US dollars. And we'll actually talk exactly about that uh, in the later finance uh, issue, but Anyways, this is terms in terms of U.S. dollars. Uh, if you want to think about, um, so so this is a currency comparison. So um, people aren't really sure whether Bitcoin is a currency. Some people think of it as more of like a commodity, like gold. So currencies need to fulfill certain properties, and and Bitcoin isn't really great at fulfilling them. Um, but it's it's actually not really great at the commodity one either. But anyways, just to throw a commodity in, um, gold uh, is, is 100 trillion. Okay, so Bitcoin's about 100 billion and, and gold's about 100 trillion. Okay, so that's a full, you know, three orders of magnitude more. And uh, if you want to think about a stock of a company, so some people think of Bitcoin as kind of like an investment, kind of like a stock of a company. Um, the biggest company right now, or at least one of the, one of the biggest, is Apple Computers, um, which has about a one trillion dollar uh, market cap. It recently crossed one trillion. It was the first company to do so. Um, so anyway, so so you can see that Bitcoin is, uh, you know, if you multiply it by ten, you kind of get in Apple territory. Uh, if you multiply it by fifty, you get in U.S. dollar territories. If you multiply it by thousand, you get into gold. Uh, territory. Okay, so it's a big number. It's real. It's substantial, but it's not as big as 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 other things um, that we have. Okay, so and and all of this will fluctuate with the exchange rate. And this is the exchange rate times the total issued Bitcoin. But there's a lot of Bitcoin that's probably lost. You know, maybe people lost their keys, or uh, in fact, we know about some Bitcoin that has been lost. And so really no one knows how much is in circulation. Same with the US dollars. I mean, there's money that gets burned or destroyed or something like that. And so the, the central bank will know, or the treasury, sorry, in this case, would, would know how much it's issued, um, but it wouldn't necessarily know how much is actually in circulation. Um, but, but anyways, and same with gold. Gold is sort of an estimate because we've been producing gold for, for a long time. Um, Okay, uh, so that's Bitcoin in terms of, of its value. And this is important because what I really want to do is I want to kind of talk about the economics of mining. And it's important to, to understand that miners receive something that's of real value. So when you mine and you win, 
uh, the proof of work and you mine a block, you get newly created Bitcoin and that has some amount of value. And how much value that has is going to dictate whether you participate in mining or not. Um, so, so anyway, so this is why I'm, I'm sort of going through this. Um, the other thing I'll show you is, is something I'll just circle back to, which is uh, we talked about 21 million uh, Bitcoins will be created. That's the cap. Uh, so where are we at uh, today? Um, so here's a little chart that shows you um, uh, the mining reward over time. Um, so if you solve a new block, how much Bitcoin do you get? Uh, and so uh, the way that, that um, Bitcoin works, I'll call this Bitcoin's mining reward. Uh, what would happen is um, they originally, when, when Bitcoin first started, you would get 50 uh, Bitcoins in a block. And then what happened is they had a certain cutoff. Okay, so when the blockchain reached a certain number of blocks, it was programmed into the currency that the block reward uh, would have. Uh, so it would go from 50 to 25. It happened on this particular date. Okay, so, um, and because you get blocks once every 10 minutes, you can kind of extrapolate around when you would expect it to happen. But, you know, it's not perfect, right? There, the, the time, as we talked about, there's a little slippage and you have to constantly sort of readjust uh, your time and things like that. So uh, once every 10 minutes is, is, is the expected behavior, but it's not ever going to be exactly that. Um, but anyway, so, so once uh, it's, it's not about dates, it's just uh, it's about actual block numbers. But um, uh, so the block halved. Um, so anyway, so this happened in 2012. OK, um, then what happened is uh, recent, more recently uh, in 2016, uh, we reached 4,200. Uh, sorry, 420,000. And it halved again. Okay, and this is where we are today. Uh, so as of the time that I record this lecture, um, uh, if you solve a block today, uh, you would get twelve point five Bitcoin uh, as your reward. Okay, and Bitcoin's worth a couple thousand dollars. Okay, so um, so if you solve one of these, uh, you're getting tens of thousands of dollars uh, for for every block. Uh, that's that's sort of the exchange rate. Okay, uh, the next have will happen at uh, this block, and we're not sure when it is. Uh, but if you figure that it will be exactly every ten minutes, uh, then we would expect to see it in twenty twenty one. Okay, so that's not too far off. Uh, maybe there, there's a good chance that actually maybe you're listening to this and it, it is twenty twenty one or after. Um, and so in this case, uh, the amount of Bitcoin that's being uh, issued for every block is 6.25, okay? And then it will have again, and this chart doesn't go all the way down. Um, what will, will happen is eventually it will go down to zero. Uh, when it goes down to zero, we'll all be dead. I forget when it happens. Um, yeah, I should have I should have pulled that number out, but it's in twenty one fifty or something like that. Now, because this is YouTube, actually, maybe you aren't dead, <laughs> because uh, you know who knows how long these these uh, videos are going to last. But um, anyways, uh, eventually it will go to zero. Okay, and then we can also go over here and we can see um, the point of blockchain is, or sorry, the point of Bitcoin is it releases a lot of Bitcoin quickly and then it sort of tapers off. So most of the Bitcoin comes into existence. For example, way back in 2012, right? Um, actually, sorry, in 2011 in actuality. Um, so about two years uh, after it was released, about three years, sorry, after it was released, um, it had already reached half of the Bitcoin. So half of it came into circulation very, very quickly. Uh, then it starts to taper off a bit, okay? And so today, um, you know, depending on where you are, uh, you know, something like like more than 80% of the Bitcoin that's going to be released, at least 80% of this uh, 21 million Bitcoin is in circulation uh, today. OK, um, so it releases uh, slowly and then slows down or it releases fast and then slows down.
Okay, and I want to emphasize this is part of the design of the protocol. So the software does this automatically. So all of this is programmed into the software. And so when you download Bitcoin and you run it, you're downloading software that has this programmed into it. Uh, why is this the actual schedule itself? Well, the person who invented Bitcoin came up with it. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, we don't know all the full details. Um, there's some indication of, of his sort of, you know, kind of, economic beliefs and um you know it was certainly clear that that he wanted a currency that was algorithmically determined as opposed to what would happen if this was us dollars is that the central bank uh could could uh decide to increase the amount or decrease the amount uh of money in circulation uh, that's not as simple as the way I said it. Um, so it, it actually turns out to be a lot more complicated. And the central bank doesn't actually introduce new physical currency into circulation. They have a, a slightly different mechanism, but um, we may or may not talk about that at some future lecture. But uh, anyways, the idea here is that um, you would have an algorithm, everyone can see it. Um, and the idea of having a hard cap instead of having it inflate forever, not really sure why that's the case. Uh, one thing that a lot of people do is they'll make a copy of Bitcoin and they'll change uh, this this schedule. Uh, so they might make it in flight forever or they, you know, they'll make different tweaks to it. And uh, none of these alternatives where that's the only change that they've made to the currency has really caught on. Uh, so as of today, which is about 10 years after Bitcoin was released, um, there isn't really something that's like Bitcoin with a different schedule that, that lots of people want to own. Um, but anyways, people have proposed it. And the thing about Bitcoin is you can take the software and you can make a copy of it and tweak it and then have your own currency if you want. Um, so anyways, okay, so that's the, the, the reward schedule. Um, so, so the main thing to, to go back to is that miners today, they get about $10,000 per block, uh, more than that actually, quite a bit more, but in the tens of thousands, between 10 and $100,000 uh, per block. So they get a substantial amount of money. And so if you hear that number, you might say, great, I wanna mine Bitcoin myself, right? I'm gonna set up my computer to mine uh, and then I'm gonna get rich. Uh, doing that. Okay, so let's think about the economics of mining. Okay, so you're going to receive a block reward. Receive a block reward if you solve a block. Okay, uh, how likely is this? How likely is it that you're gonna uh, receive a block reward? Or how likely is it to solve a block? Well, there's two things that influence it, okay? Uh, so the first thing that influence it is, actually you can put both of these two together, but let's split them apart. We'll just think of it as one thing. Uh, how likely? So you can remember that, that this is like a lottery, okay? It's a lottery based on computational power. Okay, so one way to win a lottery or to increase the likelihood that you win a lottery is to buy more tickets. And so in this case, you would have to increase your computation. Um, so you can increase uh, computation uh, and then this will increase likelihood. Okay. The other thing is that the, the chances of winning a lottery also depends on how many lottery tickets are there out there, right? So you can increase the number of lottery tickets, but if everybody increases, like let's say everybody doubles the number of lottery tickets they have, then your odds didn't change at all. Everyone just has more lottery tickets. So it's important to, to remember that this is a competitive environment. You're competing against the other people. Um, so if you increase uh, competition, or if the competition increases, it's not like you choose it, the market chooses to increase competition, uh, then that's going to decrease the likelihood. Okay, so how, how competitive is the market? Uh, well, what I can tell you is um, the market is, is, is very highly competitive now. Uh, so it's currently
Um, so it's, uh, if you mind, it used to be the case that, you know, sort of historically, in the early days of Bitcoin, you could mine on a single computer. And so it was sort of hobbyists. Uh, then what people did is they would get uh, what are called GPUs, uh, which are ways of, you know, they're kind of like graphic cards that you might use to play video games. And they're capable of doing parallel processing. And because uh, when you solve these hashes, the probability that you solve it is independent of how many other ones you've solved. Uh, you can very trivially uh, parallelize it so so you can as many cores as you have you can have them all computing hashes as fast as they can and you just want to make sure that none of them are using exactly the same nonce uh, to solve it and then that's fine um, so people would buy gpus and then they started to buy racks and at this point it kind of switched from uh what what you might call hobbyists meaning just people who are interested in uh to commercial enterprises okay um so now people were doing this as a business and they were doing it on a big scale, uh, you know. And so this persists today where a uh, standard Bitcoin mining operation is, it looks like a data center, right? There's, there's tons and tons of computers. It's not like something you're renting out of your house. Um, then what, what you can do is, uh, so GPUs are, um, you know, you still have computer instructions that you're sending to the GPU in terms of what you want to do. What you could do is take those computer instructions and just print out a circuit that does exactly what you want it to do. Uh, so this is called an ASIC, Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So it's basically a circuit that only solves Bitcoin uh, proof of work puzzles. Um, because it's a circuit, it's very fast. You can do it in a couple clock cycles. Uh, and uh, it's low energy compared to CPUs. It's not like you have a computer that's farming out data to these, these GPUs. You just have a chip and it's doing exactly Bitcoin. Of course, if Bitcoin ever went to zero, then you would have to throw these away, whereas your GPUs could maybe be repurposed for some other, uh, some other task. Or over time, uh, what will happen is, you'll say you set up a big mining operation with GPUs, and then all of a sudden your competitors come out with ASICs, now you can't compete anymore, right? They have way more lottery tickets than you. Uh, and so you're not really competitive. And so you have to kind of throw your GPUs away and, and buy ASICs. But then maybe you get the first generation of ASICs and then it happens again where there's a better generation that comes out. And, and so anyways, you can churn through these technologies. And uh, as it gets, this is the most general computer you can use for anything. GPUs have a lot of applications and ASICs that are specific to Bitcoin have no applications other than Bitcoin itself. Maybe some cryptocurrencies that are closely related to Bitcoin, but um, so that's sometimes this stuff gets repurposed for other cryptocurrencies, but outside of the cryptocurrency space, there's no application at all for these. And so these chips are, are highly specialized and they're basically garbage if, if you can't use them for Bitcoin because they're, they're not competitive technologies anymore. Okay, so that's going to be a big influence on whether you decide uh, to set up a mining operation or not. Um, so this is your overhead or your capital costs, which are your equipment. Okay, so uh, let's just think about all the considerations that you would make. Uh, so if you want to set up a mining operation, um, you have to think about your capital costs or overhead costs. Uh, so this is basically your equipment. Okay, and then you have uh, your marginal costs. So your marginal costs are, your capital costs are things that, that once you buy it once, it doesn't matter if you solve one block with it or if you solve a thousand blocks with it, it's the same cost, right? You set up your operation and um, you know, the, the, the cost is the cost, it doesn't change. And then your marginal cost is uh, once you've solved, you know, that first block is really expensive because you have to get all your equipment and stuff. But then the second block isn't quite as expensive because it's just just the cost of, of, of solving that additional block. So think of it as you solved a thousand blocks, now you're going to solve the thousand and first block. What's the cost of solving that block given that you've already paid for the first thousand? Okay, so all your capital costs aren't a particular interest. Um, Basically, the big marginal cost that goes into it is the electricity. Okay, so you pay, um, you know, every single block, you pay some electricity. The other thing with these data centers is they run hot. 
Um, so you have uh, cooling costs as well. Okay, and then there's some other factors that you have to consider that aren't related to your economics per se. Um, but you want to think about, for example, network connectivity. Uh, so you want to have good network connectivity uh, because when you solve your blocks, you have to send it around to the peer-to-peer -peer network. And if you don't send it fast enough, then someone else might solve it at the same time. Then there's going to be a fork, and then there's some chance that your block that you solved is going to get orphaned. Okay, so you want to be able to broadcast um, your uh, your block as, as quickly as possible, okay? And in particular, you want to broadcast it to the other miners because they're your competitors. And we showed that the economics makes sense that if, if they see your block and they agree it's valid, that, that, that they'll try and build on top of it, okay? Uh, assuming that they don't have, you know, a large fraction of, 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 of the network and they're, they're not doing some sort of block withholding attack. Um, so uh, network connectivity, especially if you co-locate with other miners, that's, that's always good. Um, and then the final thing too is, is uh, you want some sort of government stability. Uh, so Bitcoin isn't legal in every single country. Uh, and in countries where it's, it is legal, um, there still could be regulation or uncertainty around how Bitcoin will be regulated. Um, if you're setting up a mining operation, what, what's your obligations in terms of taxation and uh, those, those types of things. And so uh, you want some sort of you know, government stability. Okay, and the thing about mining is that you can really choose anywhere in the world to do it. And so what people will do is they'll look at these types of things. Um, so for example, one country where there's a lot of mining uh, is China. And so in China, you're close to the supply chain. And so you can often get uh, equipment uh, a little bit cheaper uh, than you could if you uh, had it shipped, uh, say, to the US or Canada where we are. Um, electricity is relatively cheap. Uh, if you locate in, in different areas of China, especially in the north, uh, you could have cold climates where your cooling costs wouldn't be as expensive. Uh, the network connectivity is, is fine. Uh, you have to balance that. So you don't want to get so remote that it's really cool, but you don't have good network connectivity. And because there's a lot of miners uh, in China, you tend to, to hear about other Chinese miners' uh, blocks very, very quickly. Uh, the only thing that, that's sort of questionable about China as a mining operation is the government stability. Um, so um, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. And the reason that I, I sort of think about this is so often is that uh, one of the alternatives is where I live. So I'm recording this in Montreal, uh, which is in Canada. And uh, a lot of people, especially people that are in China, they're starting to, you know, once again, this is very, this might time date, you know, um, timestamp this this lecture, but in 2018, um, they're not so certain about the government stability. This is a risk factor that could affect their money. And so they're starting to look at alternatives. And Canada, you know, your capital costs are, are going to be a bit more, um, but we have really cheap electricity, especially in northern Quebec. Uh, there's electricity that's being produced that's actually not even being used. It's just being thrown away uh, from hydro uh, dams. And uh, the climate is cold uh, in, the, in northern Quebec, and so you have really good cooling costs, and the network connectivity is very, very good, uh, especially uh, to, to the rest of North America. Uh, of course, if you want to cross the oceans, then, then you're on one or a couple of cables that, that go across the ocean. Uh, and then the, the government's a little more friendly and, and even considering uh, subsidizing mining operations, although they haven't committed to do that yet. Um, so. Anyway, so th this mining is, is sort of interesting. Um, the other thing I'll say about mining is sometimes people ask, well, what happens if, um, if uh, let's say the exchange rate plummets uh, for whatever reason, we're not sure why, uh, then all the miners go away. Who cares? You know, like what, what, does, what, what difference does that make? Um, and the answer is, it's sort of a complicated answer, but Bitcoin originally ran perfectly fine when it was just one computer that was mining, which was the inventor's uh, mining, or at least, you know, maybe he had uh, seven or eight computers, but, but anyways, he had a very small network, okay? And so Bitcoin, it actually works. It doesn't matter if how many miners you have, how much computational power you have on the network. Um, all of these issues aren't really that significant. Uh, the only thing that really matters is that it's really hard for someone new to come in the network and get that 51%, okay? So the main reason that you want a large network with lots of people mining and a lot of diversity and decentralization uh, of this network is to make it hard for one 
single entity to amass that 51%, okay? That's really the only condition. Aside from that condition, you really don't care about how big mining is or, or how small of an operation it is. Um, there's been some work to try and tie the exchange rate to mining economics. And, and anyway, none of that stuff is conclusive. So that's still, there's a lot of really open questions in terms of uh, finance and, and economics and why Bitcoin's exchange rate is what it is and, and those types of things. Um, okay, the one thing, the, uh, one other thing I want to talk about is uh, something called a mining pool. Okay, so what can happen is, let's say you're a miner and you're mining by yourself, so we sometimes call this solo mining. Okay, and let's think about your income. Okay, so you have all these costs, but your income is, this is sort of like time, and uh, every now and then you're going to solve a block, and you're going to get a huge chunk of Bitcoin. Okay, but then you're going to go a long time without solving a block, and then you're going to get another huge chunk of Bitcoin, and you're going to go, you know, some other time and, and get another huge chunk of Bitcoin. And this is very variable, right? Because this is all probabilistic, right? It's all based on, you know, maybe you get lucky, you win the lottery. Maybe it takes you a while to lose the lottery. Like there's no guarantee that if you have the most lottery tickets that you're going to win, right? You know, eventually you will by, by probability, right? Uh, but there's, there's no guarantees. It's all probabilities, right? So you could get really unlucky and go a really long time and you're gonna have to pay electricity uh, in these gaps uh, between uh, every time you mine, okay? Uh, so the economics of mining are, are very, not great. Uh, they're very variable uh, in terms of, you have a variable income stream, okay? So your income stream is, is, is highly variable. So then what miners do is they say, hey, here's what we're gonna do. What we're gonna do is we're going to get a bunch of miners together and we're going to form a kind of collective. Okay. And the collective is going to be a little more powerful than solo mining. So it's going to win blocks more often. Okay. But then once it wins a block, it's going to split it up amongst the, the persons. Okay. So this person's income stream is they're going to get one fifth of what they were getting if they solo mine, but they're going to get that one fifth sort of more often, okay? So they're going to get a more, you know, they're going to get a little amount of money more frequently as opposed to a large amount of money infrequently, okay? Okay, so this moves toward a fixed income stream. And the bigger the collective gets, the more reliably it can solve blocks. And then the, the, the better and better uh, your income stream uh, ends up being. And the important point is that you don't make more money here or here, okay? You make the same amount of money. It's really about changing the shape of how you make your money, okay? Here you might make a little less money because there's probably fees and things like that uh, for the collective. So you don't get exactly a fifth. You get a fifth minus some, some uh, overhead costs of maintaining the collective. Um, so maybe you make slightly more money here, so you pay a little bit of a penalty to smooth out uh, your income stream. But anyways, the move from solo mining to collective, or, or this is sometimes called a mining pool, um, it's not about making more or less money. It's really just about changing the shape of, of how your income stream looks. Okay. Now, the really cool thing that I, I really love about mining pools is um, how do you know that, for example, we said we split it in five, okay? If we split it in five, we're making this assumption that everyone has equal computational power, okay? They're all contributing equally to the collective, okay? But how do we know that that's really the case? How do we know that this person isn't just saying that they're, they're mining in the collective interests, but really they're just sort of mining for themselves? Or maybe they spend half of their time mining for the collective and they spend half of their time mining for yourself, okay? And even as I say that, you might be unclear of what does it mean to mine for the collective? Like what, do, what does it look like? What exactly is different about mining for yourself or mining for the collective, okay? And so Bitcoin actually offers a really cool, natural uh, solution uh, to this problem. And so uh, let's just remind ourselves of uh, what exactly they're doing. 
Um, so we've drawn this out a few times now, so hopefully it's, it's starting to sink in. Uh, but what they're doing is they're solving this proof of work, which says that the hash of all the transactions put into a Merkle root and the previous block and this nonce uh, that you're going to tweak uh, is going to be less than uh, some target value. Okay, so this is the proof of work uh, that they're trying to do. Okay, and uh, basically what you're going to do is uh, you're going to do two things. The first thing is the Merkle root has the set of transactions. Okay, that's what it is. And the first transaction in the set of transactions is the Coinbase transaction where the miner pays themselves. Okay, and so inside it is the miner's uh, address, right? There's a transaction that says, hey, this, this newly minted Bitcoin plus all the fees, it's, it's going into this address. This is the address, okay? So if I give you a Merkle root, it has the mining address that will get paid baked into it, okay? So when you decide whether you're solving this proof of work with this Merkle root, what you're doing is you're mining on behalf of the miner whose address is specified in this coin base, okay? So there's no way to, for example, let's say you have your own address here, you solve it, or let's let's put it the other way. Let's say that the, the collective's address is in this Coinbase transaction. You solve the proof of work and you're like, great, I'm gonna keep that for myself. Well, if you wanna keep it for yourself, you're gonna to have to change this address to your own address, okay? Which is gonna change the value of this transaction which is going to change at least one of the hashes in your set of transactions. And when you hash that up the Merkle tree, it's going to completely change the Merkle tree and the root's going to end up being completely different. And when the root is different, then it's no longer going to be a solution, right? It's going to be, you know, you change this value, then it's no longer going to be the hash of something that's smaller than this, okay? So when you solve a proof of work, you're sort of committing to who you're solving it for, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, obviously you don't want, uh, so, so what will happen is there will be some person who runs the mining pool. Uh, so they'll be like the, the, the sort of coordinator and they'll send out the Merkle root, okay? And the previous block, okay? And then what the miners will do is they'll all try to, to solve the nonce value. And obviously you don't want them all to, 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 to solve it uh, the same. So you don't want minor one to start from zero and minor two to start from zero and minor three to start from zero because then they'll all do the same amount of work, okay? There'll be an overlap in all the values that you're testing. So usually what you do with the nonce is you kind of split it up. Um, and so you can just think of it as a number and uh, you kind of make everything all zeros and then you give you know, to, to minor one, you say, okay, you, you know, you try every value here, and then minor two, you try every value here, and minor three, you try every value here. Um, this isn't a perfect way of splitting it up, but the idea is that uh, just sort of visually, you can see that you're going to kind of split up this search space of this nonce. Uh, so different people are going to try different values uh, for it, okay? Um, so, so anyways, that's how you coordinate. And notice that even if you're a solo miner, if you have a bunch of ASICs, you're doing the exact same thing. You know, you're giving one of your chips this search space, one this search space, one this search space, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, or if you have a bunch of GPUs, same idea, okay? Um, so this is, this is how you're going to run it, okay? Now, let's go back to the hard problem. The hard problem is how do you know that this person's contributing one fifth of uh, the work, okay? Uh, so what will happen is that as you start mining, you're going to start spitting out hashes. And I'm going to, I'm going to go back to this idea of leading zeros as opposed to smaller than a target just because it's easy, easier to visualize. But basically, as you hash it, what will happen is you'll get kind of close. You'll be like, okay, I got something that has like, you know, a bunch of leading zeros. It's not quite enough. You know, this is, this is the target. I need something that, that has this many leading zeros. Um, Right, but anyways, I have this value, and then I have some other value, and it has you know a couple of leading zeros, but then it's missing a couple, and then you know eventually I um, will solve it, and I'll get something that has exactly the right number of leading zeros. X means just don't care, it could be a zero or a one. Okay, so this is a, a solution. 
Okay, so this is what a miner will do, is, is they'll, they'll sort of generate these values. And these values you can think of as partial solutions. And the nice thing is that um, for every solution uh, that you find, so this has a certain number of leading zeros, we'll call this L leading zeros. Okay, a partial solution that has L minus one, for every solution uh, that has L leading zeros, you're gonna find two solutions on average that have L minus one or one less leading zero. And you're gonna find four that have L minus two and you're gonna find eight that have L minus three, okay? Um, so if you don't follow the math, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that these partial solutions are still kind of hard to find. They're not as hard to find as this, but they're still kind of hard. Uh, and you're going to find them a lot more frequently than you're going to find these, okay? Um, so maybe this is L over two, or, or let's say three L over four, so three quarters of L, okay? Uh, this is a partial solution. And so you'll find, um, so before you expect to find a solution, so once again, it's all probabilistic, right? Uh, you expect to find uh, a certain number that you can put a number on. You know, that you'll find 128 partial solutions on average before you find one solution. And it's all going to be parameterized based on, on what, what the target is uh, for your solution. Okay, so you'll find a, a set number of partial solutions. Okay, and so what a mining pool will do is they'll say, every time you find a partial solution, send it in. Okay, and then what we'll do is we'll look at how fast are you finding these partial solutions because that's telling me how fast you're gonna find an actual solution. Okay, because you can't produce partial solutions any faster than, than you can produce solution. I mean, you're, sorry, you're producing uh, partial solutions faster than you're producing actual solutions but you can't change that, that ratio between uh, how fast a partial solution comes and how fast a, a full solution comes, okay? So um, by looking at these partial solutions, I can estimate how many hashes are you producing per second in order to get a partial solution every 10 minutes or every five minutes or every one minute or whatever uh, it is, okay? So I can use partial solutions as a way to, to, to tell how fast you're hashing, and then based on how ha fast you're hashing, I know, um, I know how fast you're finding actual solutions, and then I can pay you in proportion to how fast uh, you're finding, okay? So I use this to, uh, so, so, you, um, so you broadcast partial solutions, even though they're not useful for anything, uh, they, they're kind of like a benchmark for your hash rate. Uh, so you broadcast uh, partial solutions and based on how fast you can broadcast partial solutions, uh, you can get an estimate of your computational power. It's called the hash rate, which is the number of hashes per second, but it's, uh, you can think of it as computational power. And then, uh, and then you're paid in proportion to this. So this is, anyways, this is how uh, a mining pool will operate. Uh, and, the, and the thing is that you can't fake it, right? So you can't sort of pretend to be uh, generating more Bitcoin or generating hashes faster uh, than you actually are. Because what we can do is we can enforce it by requiring you to send these partial solutions uh, as well as all the full solutions that you find.